Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Gershman. Uh, I have the good fortune of heading strategy and sales operations for Schneider Electric's US services and solutions team. And we are here today uh, to talk about unlocking the value of our assets uh, and the related shift in investment uh, from CapEx to OpEx. Now, I don't know if we have any accountants among us, but if we do, I will apologize ahead of time. Uh, this is not going to be a legal accounting FASB 13 kind of conversation about CapEx and OpEx. What we're really going to be talking about here when we say CapEx is all about capital outlays and typically what comes with it, a major and rigid process for investment versus OpEx or capital outflows, which often comes with it a more flexible process for investment. So, uh, no FASB discussions, but it will certainly be a, a finance-centric one. Um, and when I say CapEx to OpEx and, and, and shifting an investment from CapEx to OpEx, my guess is that for many of you, the first thought is of the cloud, of the IT space. And that makes total sense, right? Driven in large part uh, by the rise of the cloud, companies no longer need to buy physical assets, whether uh, upfront, whether that's servers, racks, uh, other hardware, they can use that capital to derive potential benefits, savings, uh, more controlled expense, paying only for what they need, freeing up capital to be invested in other places. But I'm here to say that that CapEx to OpEx phenomenon, that, that investment shift, is not just an IT phenomenon. Uh, it's certainly a story that has its roots with technology as an enabler, and we're going to talk with our panel a lot about that today. Um, but this is far from just a software as a service story. It's one that at Schneider we see cutting across industries. And I'll say that there really are three themes that we see related to this CapEx to OpEx investment shift, either driving that shift or driven by. The first is the rise of as a service model. So not just software as a service, but uh, uh, battery as a service, lighting as a service, energy as a service. We were just talking before about manufacturing as a service. Companies bringing in uh, uh, those um, uh, companies that, that enable uh, faster, more flexible manufacturing processes for the shop floor. Second trend that we see uh, is the move toward uh, uh, innovation in modernization. Uh, if I had a dime for every time I talked with one of our customers who said, I didn't realize you could do that, uh, instead of doing the big rip and replace project, but rather doing a modernization one, one that extends the life cycle of the asset. And along with that now, increasingly more and more, uh, it's coupled with IoT-driven predictive technology, remote service capabilities. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention ecostructure. Uh, and the third trend, uh, and, and one, again, which we'll talk quite a bit about today, uh, are more flexible financing solutions. So even when you do decide to do that big project, what has historically been that capital allocation project, uh, when you make the decision to do that, executing the financing for that project outside of the traditional scope of that very rigid, very inflexible capital financing model. All right. so. Rather than focusing on that FASB tax depreciation set of rules, we are going to talk today about why. Why this rise in the trend from CapEx to OpEx and what it means for unlocking the value of your assets. We're going to talk about utilization, about doing more with less. We'll talk about deriving greater value from the investments that you're making. We'll talk about flexibility, about paying for only what you need, about having the latest and greatest technology about not being saddled with non-core assets. We'll talk a bit about P&L shaping, otherwise known as focusing on what it is you really do best. Uh, and then we'll talk about cash flow. Uh, and when we talk about cash flow, it's really got two components here, right? One is about agility, being able to move quickly in a changing environment. And the other is really about predictability, being able to ride those ups and downs. And last but not least, when we talk about the rise and the trend uh, in CapEx to OpEx, uh, it's not the flashiest, but it is the practical reality uh, that sometimes it's just the path of least resistance. Spending, you know, not having that pool of money, big money up front, 
it gets things to go a little bit faster. OK, um, so uh, with that, uh, I am excited today to be joined by this incredible panel of folks. Folks, please, panel, come on up. Uh, we've got Maureen Ehrenberg, president of Integrated Facility Management from JLL. Uh, Helder De Silva, the energy manager in North America for ArcelorMittal. Thibault Chevalier, who's the chief financial officer from Kyotherm, which is a financer of energy projects. And Chris Whipple, the chief uh, operating officer from Outlier Energy, uh, which does a range of energy development projects. And so over the next 40 minutes or so, these guys will provide some great insight and perspective on this trend, which means my job is mostly done. Um, what we will do uh, is, uh, for each one of the, the folks on the panel, they'll spend about five minutes talking a little bit about the whys, the whats, and the hows of what they're seeing related to this uh, CapEx to OpEx trend. Uh, and then at the end of it, we'll do some Q&A. We'll have some moderated Q&A, and time dependent, maybe we'll even do some audience Q&A. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Maureen. OK. Thanks, Alex. Um, JLL is a global real estate services organization. Um, we manage uh, over a billion feet of uh, facilities, but also work in all the transactions. Um, we do strategic consulting, lease administration. So you can imagine across, when we look at um, owners and occupiers, investors in real estate, the issues right now um, have become very real. And for the last four years, what we've seen is, um, we also refer to it as a convergence. And I, I heard um, convergence earlier, but when we talk about convergence, we look at the built environment and say that what's happened is that it's gone from a very static offering. It's been static for so many years where things were um, bought very incrementally, managed incrementally, and the accounting treatment has been pretty consistent. And about really four years ago, we started looking at the change that was happening in real estate, the biggest enablement was taking that facility structure, the built, um, just the building itself, technology running through it, and then converging with the workplace to create a completely different offering. And it actually started to become a dynamic offering. And uh, an example of that is with WeWork, um, when you can buy space as a service. And uh, if you think about employees, the cloud workforce right now, many of our customers have a balance between their employees and then a pretty large portion of a on-demand workforce. So consultants or independent contractors that come in for a period of time to work on a project and go. And so they wanted ultimate flexibility in their space. So when you look at the space and how inefficient real estate has traditionally been, what the um, be able, becoming dynamic, what it's done is it's untethered people from their desks, from their workstations, so now with a, a mobile environment, through the use of Wi-Fi, the phones, and also just being able to plug and play wherever in the workplace, most of these workplaces are coming down, much less unassigned space. So the capital investment, whether it's a lease or a new building, you, know, you can see the, um, the occupancy going down. Maybe the, the lease itself is about cut in half. But the density is pretty dense, but it ebbs and flows throughout the day. And if you think about just carrying that overhead, what it's been able to do is allow our, our owners, our investors, and the different occupiers, whether it's within healthcare, technology, financial services, release a lot of this capital that's been tied up in real estate and move to this business transformation they're all going through. So the biggest trend that we've seen in this transformation of the, the looking at space as a dynamic uh, offering or service is that it relates back, we, we had a mention of Davos earlier, and I put this chart together because I thought it, it might be helpful for the context of the way we look at it. When we look at a traditional maintain of a building, when we look at the tools and the techniques, we want it to be um, maintainable, and a high level of maintainability is great for life cycle planning and for um, lengthening the investment cycle that we have for some of the uh, equipment that we have, predictive preventive maintenance, Sustainability is key, and then, of course, reliability. And this all relates back to corporate social responsibility. So most of the clients that we see, when they look at their buildings, they, um, in the past, have been thought of as an overhead group. And the biggest change that we've seen is that real estate, in many ways, is no longer seen as this necessary evil, this big drag in overhead, this very, very expensive uh, cost proposition, but instead, when they start looking at corporate social responsibility, 
it can be an enabler for a lot of the things that the C-suite is looking for and for the shareholders. So when you start looking at business resiliency, talent retention and attraction for creating an amazing employee experience to make sure that you um, can keep that talent, attract new talent, because you've got the best workplace so people can do their best work every day. And then you start looking at transparency and supply chain, diversity, the sustainability agenda, um, resiliency, the ability, the ability for the organization to respond very quickly to whether it's uh, right now with the healthcare systems in Northern California we're working with through the fires, the uptime is critically important. And so by being able to create a much more data-driven environment that becomes um, much more not only predictable but transparent, it actually releases capital into real estate that's never been available before. Because in the past, there was an ask that didn't, people weren't really seeing a return on investment. But today, these outcomes that you start looking at is what, what is it that will enable um, the organization as, as far as their corporate social responsibility? And if you start looking at some of these investments, what's happening is it connects the dots for the C-suite to say, this can become an offering that when we connect all of these dots, We've got all of these different initiatives that are working with HR. We're working with the IT departments. We're looking at how space is consumed. We're looking at energy utilization, the ability to report back. So the most exciting thing that's happening is the convergence that, and working with companies like Schneider, our ability to have far more transparency and predictability has also changed the valuation. So what's happened is, within many of these properties, to become more of a digital offering, the valuation and the intrinsic value of these properties are actually going up as a result of these investments. So I'll leave it at that. Excellent. Thanks, Maureen. OK, Helder. OK. Asalomieto, who is Asalomieto? Asalomieto is, is the global leader of steel making in the world. We had a production in 2017 of 85 million tons, metric tons, with the help of 200,000 employees. Uh, spread out across the globe, having industrial presence in North America, South America, Africa, West Europe, CIS. And with this big steel making, it means we have also a very big energy consumption. And our energy consumption in 2017 could power USA for over a week to give the order of magnitude of uh, energy consumption. Uh, with a very big energy consumption, it means a very big carbon footprint. So that's why uh, to be a responsible energy user is among our pillars in terms of sustainability. Uh, in terms of results, in 2017 in North America, oh, go back, please. We, we saved over $24 million uh, on energy. Also, in terms of carbon footprint, we reduced our uh, carbon intensity by 11% in 10 years, which for us is a very big uh, accomplishment. So we have very, very big challenges inside the Solometo, and I listed some of them. The first one is education. We talk a lot about artificial intelligence, but we, have, we need to take care also of our natural intelligence, our employees. So we need to educate them on how to save energy, on how to save, uh, how, how to mitigate our carbon footprint. Another point is to motivate them. We have 200,000 employees globally, and we need to try to find ways to motivate them to save energy and save CO2. After that, uh, we need to help them to prioritize what to do first and we normally try to go for the low hanging fruit in terms of energy savings. But at some point we need money to do the project. And inside our company, it's a very capital intensive industry. We need a lot of capex to, 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 to keep the operations. We need money for health and safety, 200,000 employees, we need money for environmental compliance. We need money for quality production, etc. So at the end of the line, it's, we have the energy people asking for money. 
and we don't have all the money we want. That's why I'm a very big fan of the from CAPEX to OPEX framework. I believe it can bring very good benefits for us. Thank you, thank you, Elder. It couldn't be, uh, couldn't be a better introduction to, to Q-Term. And uh, so I'm a CFO of Q-Term, which is a, an equity investor uh, in energy efficiency project. And um, yeah, Q-Term was basically founded out of the, the situation that you just described. Uh, if, we, if we focus on the industry sector, uh, it accounts for more than one third of the uh, primary, primary energy consumption in the US. It's more or less the same in, in Europe. Uh, so there is a big chunk of the, the, the primary energy consumption. There is a huge potential uh, unlocked by uh, new techniques, new products, by technology. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, very, very few projects are being implemented. And I mean, one of the reasons why you, you, you mentioned it is uh, uh, it's basically this capex alloc allocation. It's the, the fact that it's non-core business for indus industrial players like you. And also the, the payback of such projects are often above two to four years, which is, which is also too long for, for uh, an industrial player to, to commit on, on, a, on an investment like that. Um, so so Pure Term um, is there to, to fill this gap in, in the financing space to offer, we're not talking about counting, but still, I mean, to offer enough balance sheet solution, it's key for, for, uh, for clients to, for this financing solution to be off balance. Uh, with this um, savings as a service model, um, this energy performance contract. What's the, the, the approach is, um, basically, Kyoterm would finance 100% of the, the capex, the, the cost of implementation of the energy solution um, energy efficiency solution. Uh, Kyoto would take care of the operation and maintenance. Um, there would be uh, an energy uh, reference, energy consumption set out in the contract, uh, agreed in agreement with the client, which is basically the, uh, the energy consumption of the, the perimeter before implementation of the, the EE solution. There would be, and here is the key of, say, of all the, the the model is this MNV protocol, this measurement and verification protocol that needs to be agreed between the parties as well, um, where it's, um, the goal is to verify and to quantify the savings um, generated thanks to the solution. The savings being the megawatt hour that are going to be saved. Could be electricity, could be gas, um, but it's the key. And the client will actually pay Full, fully variable fee based on the amount of megawatt hour which is um, computed based on this, on this protocol. Um, so at the end of the day, the client is, doesn't invest in the, in, in the equipment. So we bear no financial risk. There is no performance risk. Um, and this fee is treated, once again, <laughs> from an accounting perspective, from in US GAAP or in uh, IFRS, um, accounting principle is treated as, is treated as an OPEX. Um, we have also a chart, uh, Alex, which is a, a basic chart showing the, 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 the approach, which is you have the, the green top line is the, is the uh, energy costs um, before any implementation of the solution. You have the bottom line, this blue bottom line, which is the, the cost after implementation of the solution. And in between, basically, is the savings, which are shared between term and the client um, on the on the this year it's something around 30 70 30 basis here and the the split of the savings is basically directly linked to the length of the contract so it's typically typically 10 years we do have access at your term to long-term money so we can uh, finance project with long payback um, typically six to seven years it shouldn't be an issue depending on, on the client. Um, and um, I always say it's we, but um, we are not, we at your term, we are not a technology provider, we are not OEM, we are not uh, an integrated uh, energy service company. Uh, so we rely on strong partnership and very strong partner like Schneider Electric um, in Europe and, and worldwide and to bring the solution to uh, design and to implement the solution and monitor it on, on the long term 
um, I would say that we are just bringing the, this CapEx to, to OPEX approach. Technology-wise, and just to, to, to give just a few minutes, um, more, more generally what, what Kyotem does, we are basically financing all GHG uh, um, emission uh, reducing projects. Uh, we just don't do the mainstream uh, wind and PV uh, uh, generating assets, but apart from that, you can finance any typology of project. We're really agnostic when it comes to technology. And we have two main area of focus. The first one is renewable heat uh, generation projects, uh, such as geothermal, it could be shallow, it could be deep, deep geothermal for district heating network. Uh, we're doing biomass, liquid and solid, waste wood, uh, um, waste. Uh, we're doing solar thermal, waste heat, heat recovery industry, and also energy savings projects. And we have a very good traction with um, variable speed drives uh, on motors. Um, and last but not least, this one hurdle we haven't mentioned uh, earlier is the, the size of the project in the, in the energy efficiency. Um, we at Cotem, we can work on big projects, uh, more than web finance projects, more than $15 million in geothermal energy, where CapEx is, uh, I mean, the cost of drilling is huge. Uh, but we can as well go as, as little as half a million dollars when it comes to, to energy savings projects. And something that I think you, you should, uh, should keep in mind that often when we think about this new, <coughs> new approach, um, people get um, reluctant to, 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 to try to, to work on this model when the product is too small. Um, we are structured and we are um, equipped to, to, to structure this, this, this kind of project very well, even if it's small, and try to keep um, a competitive cost of, of capital. Chris, I know you don't have a slide, but... No, that's perfectly fine. I, I like to talk. <laughs> um, Chris Whipple with Outlier Energy. Uh, about five years ago, we were working on a project with a hotel group down in Texas, uh, looking at various cogeneration plants to replace their aging central utility plants within their facilities. Spent a significant amount of time with this client, eight months, integrating with their engineering team, uh, doing site visits with different technology vendors, all to the point where we had our systems go all the way up to their board for approval. Okay. Now our projects look good. They had 28% IRRs. Normally that would pass within any board. But this is a hospital. Okay. <laughs> and our project is going against that new emergency clinic down the road that has a 70% IRR. What do you think rightfully they chose to do? Now, when we think about energy as a service, which now is all Outlier focuses on, you take a project with 28% IR, and like you were talking about, combine it with the right financial product, and we can still deliver 20% of that back to the client. Okay, now think about this. We all use IRR as a good metric to determine whether it's a good project or a bad. Okay, so if you're still saving say 500,000 a year from a cogen plant, but you invest zero dollars, what does that make your IRR? Infinite. Infinite. <laughs> exactly. So that's really the focus of what we're sitting here talking about today. Now, the thing is, it's scary, okay? Most of our clients don't know what it is we do. Obviously, we're not core business, okay? So we have to prove to them, we have to prove to our investors, that what we do is works, okay? So it's a very tight process that we go through. We spend significant amount of man hours working with our clients, learning their processes, their operations. How can we best fit in? What are their actual goals besides savings, which they all want, but they all want a decreased environmental footprint. They all want sustainability, and we actually have real technologies to deliver those in a solid manner, okay? But after spending that time with the client, then we get all techie, okay? We have databases of most of the distributed generation technologies that are out there within our client's capacity ranges. And we take uh, their buildings and we do full energy models of them. We model all of our technologies against them, just so that not only can we find the best solution for our clients, but for our vendors, we can identify which technologies don't work 
And then we can create a circular communication economy back with our vendors, providing feedback so that they can either improve their technology, improve their offerings, be able to become more competitive in the future, because ultimately that's what we want. This distributed energy revolution is here. It's here to stay. It's happening all around us. And the best we can do to work with not only our clients, but with our vendors to create the most competitive environment out there is what's going to produce the best technologies, the best offerings, the best ultimate solutions for our clients, which is what gets us all paid. Excellent. Well, I hope that you guys enjoyed uh, and learned from the, the, the pre presentations from each of the panelists. We've got a few questions that we'll ask of them. If you guys have questions of your own, there are two mics up here. Don't be shy. Come up to one of the seats in the front, and that'll signal to us that you've got a question to ask. Otherwise, I've got plenty of questions to ask, but I'd rather hear from you guys than you guys necessarily hearing from me. So if you've got a question, come on up. In the interim, while I have the graphic up on here, oops, I'm going to back this up for one second if I can. So, Tiba, one of the questions that I'm guessing a lot of folks in the audience are thinking to themselves, uh, what you're looking at is similar to a performance contract. What happens if the forecasted savings don't actually materialize in the way that you expect? Or maybe ask it in another way. What happens if the savings are exceeding what you yeah, prefer, might have expected? I prefer, it, it, prefer it this right? way. So when, changes, ha changes happen. We need a, we need a solution. It's, uh, <laughs> it's always overperforming. No, I mean, um, yeah, just to describe this, this graph, I mean, the, the, the approach is to invoice the fixed fee, variable fee, but a fixed amount per megawatt hour saved. So let's assume you have a $50 <coughs> per megawatt hour um, utility cost, could be electricity. Um, we can offer, let's say, $35 for 10 years for gaining one megawatt hour of this utility. And so that means that your term would keep 70% and the client would, would uh, <coughs> keep 30% of, of the gain. And it's, uh, it's proportional. If we are 10% below, then we would get 10% less and the client would take 10% less. And if it's 10% higher, it's, it's, it's uh, purely symmetrical up to a certain level, which could be negotiated where uh, we could, um, we could um, you know, offer a discount on the, on, on the price, a significant discount. But then the question is, is really down to how do we compute the savings at the end of the day. And the first, on the, the way that the fee is cal cal calculated, um, so in our model, we, we don't really like or we try not to take the commodity, commodity risk, uh, the commodity price risk, uh, especially when it's come to electricity. Uh, so it's not a perfect risk. It's not a perfect sharing of the savings since we are not computing savings in dollars and then splitting them, we're computing savings in megawatt hour and then fixing the price. And if the electricity price goes up, then it's, uh, uh, the, balance, the balance will go towards the client. And the, there's the question on how do we compute the savings? Uh, and there, here it's really tailor-made on each, each technology, each project. But basically, we, we can commit on what we can commit. Uh, so I uh, would say that if the, the savings are not there because of uh, something which is the responsibility of the clients. I mean, the reference energy consumption should be adjusted, or there is there is a mechanism to to make sure that um, that we get the same same fee basically. Excellent. <coughs> All right. Um, so, Maureen, question for you. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned in your comments, you, you, you started to talk a little bit about corporate social responsibility. One of the things that, you know, in, in doing the preparation, right, th there's an inherent assumption um, that it's not just the facility manager's needs that need to be met here, right? This is really a, a, a conversation about meeting the C-suite's needs. This is about CEO and CFO level engagement. So I'm, I'm, maybe you can spend a little bit more time just talking about how you frame up you know, this kind of shift that we're seeing in a way that really hits that C-suite agenda? Sure. Um, it really is about the people. So historically, in particularly in buildings, uh, the two most common benchmarks that we would always follow were the cost of utilities a square foot and the cost of the occupancy. And we use kind of a thumbnail thing to say that if it's $3 a foot for utilities, $30 a foot for occupancy, and we can save 10 to 20% on that, you know, it's a return. However, with the densification of the space, one, if we can transform that space to be far more in line 
with that organization's CSR. And that goes back to collecting a lot of data across all those elements, and particularly as it relates to business continuity and uptime, and then much more predictability about the lifetime of the capital. We have found, actually, that the most important measure is the employee productivity and the employee use per square foot. And what we started to do was benchmark the cost of our clients with this increased density. So if you think about an environment that's more open office, where you've got more people coming into the space, depending on the department, we see um, cost per square foot per employee anywhere from $300 a foot up to $1,800 a foot. And so when we go back into the C-suite and start talking about if we can increase employee productivity per square foot, meaning more, less presenteeism, less absenteeism, um, more worker productivity and more positive feedback about getting your best work done, and then also just this densification, um, you can see that the gain on that with some of the clients, it's, it's you know, the numbers completely outweigh millions and millions of dollars of return to the business outside of these <coughs> pretty flat costs in the, utility, in the facility side. So we like to look at it much more holistically. And so we also refer to it as an ecosystem. And creating that ecosystem through some sort of echo structure that can collect that data is absolutely key to this. But it all relates back to CSR. And the more we can justify the capital to say this isn't about facility spend. This is really about the mission of the organization and about having a very, very sustainable business model. That's where we get the approval and also the release of more um, operating as well. Helder, I'm, I'm interested a little bit in, in your perspective and a, a similar question, but given, given your perspective, uh, you know, it, it'll be interesting. There is a, a term that you used on your slide that there's a capital battle royal. Yeah. So that there's just a, a competition for, <laughs> yeah. for this investment. And so I, I'm curious a little bit about for you inside of now the, the you know, really Maureen's client, inside of the, the, the end user company, how do you frame up uh, you know, how, how, does, how does the energy efficiency projects that you're trying to do stack up and how essentially do you make the, 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 does the light bulb go off that says, ah, maybe there's another way to actually, you know, get, get uh, this type of project funded? Well, yes, we, we, we have uh, several projects listed. Uh, many of them, most of them, in fact, they have a very good payback in terms of IRR, for example. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's hard to get money for them, very hard. Uh, not because that the company does not want to do that, but because there's a limit for the capex, right? So we have X billion dollars a year of capex globally, and the money goes first to, as I said before, health and safety. We have 200,000 employees. Environmental compliance, still mill, environmental compliance, a lot of money. Uh, productivity, quality, expansions, etc. So at the end, there's a very na narrow margin of money left, if there is. <laughs> and sometimes we have money, sometimes we don't have money. And when we have money, we don't have money for everything that we would like on our uh, wish list. So this uh, framework from CAPEX to OPEX can help a lot for us to do several things inside our plants. From lighting to variable frequency drivers, waste heat recovery, et cetera. And it also changes the, if, if you're not funding the capital up front, then you yes. don't have the, the really short payback period necessary yes. in order to. Exactly. And this framework, one very good advantage is sometimes you have a project that does not look good in terms of simple payback, yeah. but the framework from uh, CAPEX to OPEX has a, a financial leverage in beh behind. And in terms of cash, with this framework, it, the project can make sense. It will bring value for the company. Yeah, makes total sense. Good. One last call. If anybody has any questions, I'm going to ask these guys one more, but hopefully Somebody from the audience will? All right, uh, Chris, we'll start with you on this one, but I'm actually interested to get everybody's perspective here. We started the session in, in some of my opening remarks talking about how technology really serves as the enabler for this trend. So one of my colleagues actually reminded me 
earlier today that one of the things Schneider does uh, is help companies prioritize you know, based on the criticality of need, where the investments should be made. I mean, it, it's, it's technology that enables so much of this to happen. I'm curious about your perspectives on how data, advancements in technology play into things like proving out the business case, utilization, transparency. I mean, very much of this is a data-driven, technology-driven play, and I'm curious to see how that, how, how, how that impacts for you. You know, Outlier is very fortunate that now we are brought in at the very beginning of most of our clients' projects. We work with several property developers and owners that uh, bring us in when the architect is first start starting to work on the project. For that very reason, you know, them as an organization, they aren't specialists in what we do. And yet we watch all these technologies every day, how they progress in our industry and are able to really pick and choose and find the right fits. Uh, one developer we've worked with was uh, developing data centers, okay? You look at a data center, 30% of the capex for a data center up front is on those utility systems. How do we provide a utility system that's either tier three or tier four compliant, it's not gonna go down, we aren't gonna lose anything, and it's expensive, okay? But we bring in a system where all of that goes away, okay? Their cost of their data center drops by 30%, that immediately affects the evaluation, of course, of the data center. But then we come in and we provide tier three prime power solutions. Uh, we provide the chilled water, the backup if needed, the redundancy, everything. And we provide it at a lower rate than what their utility would have provided it for them without the substation increased costs. So much lower capex costs, but much lower opex costs too. It's a win-win on both yeah. sides of the equation. And so those data centers, when you, they're evaluated and they're on the market for sale, much better solution there for the original owners than anybody else that's having theirs out there. Yeah. Maureen, the, the 330, 300, that's a, I, I, I love that, that framework. Maybe if you wanna talk a little bit about the, the technology, the, the, the data driving the metrics that matter for you in the shift. Sure. Um, the data is critically important, but one thing that uh, struck me, I was with a, a large group of clients last week, and particularly in the real estate and facility space, I was so shocked to hear a lot of people say, it's all smoke and mirrors, there's no such thing as good technology in real estate or in the building systems. And I think to simplify it, um, the big uh, area right now that people can't understand and measure as much is that utilization piece. And it's not just about what is the space you're utilizing at a point in time, but what is the cost to have those employees using that space and the cost of providing it, in addition to those old metrics and benchmarks that we've had for a very, very long time, being the three and the 30. We've been able to manage that forever, but again, in a static way. So we haven't had a lot of ability to change what those costs are. Data's changed that, but I think, in essence, the, the big issue in real estate and facilities right now is a lack of understanding um, in some centers, not all, definitely not here, but the difference between IT, where traditionally we've seen a lot of our corporate customers, the IT group has kind of jumped front and center in this kind of operating space, and there's not a lot of operations technology talent. So the ability to understand how those systems run, what data they should be pulling from the systems, how to configure that, for example, within like an echo structure sort of a system where the data actually makes sense. And so those are the metrics that matter to a manager and to an owner because what they're really trying to measure is, um, it's, it's pretty easy for us to measure what we're saving in the utilities piece, whether we're doing some sort of very clever financing um, or even on the um, occupancy side if we've been able to really reduce that footprint and drive more predictable outcomes with the equipment. It's measuring the gains in productivity on the employees and the consumption of the space. And it's really important because as the tax laws changed, where all of these companies had to take their lease space, where they used to push through as operating, and today now all of those leases have to show up on their, on their balance sheet, that's really changed the real estate equation. So now it is all about how do I do with less space? So the data is so critically important, but I think it's really getting to understand that it's multidimensional. You've got your infrastructure piece, your operating piece, and then all of the kind of the real estate data. 
and it needs to come together to tell a story. Tibo, I imagine for you that, especially with the, the valuation modeling that needs to be done, I, maybe you want to talk a little bit about the, the evolution of, of the, the data and the technology being able to drive that piece of it for you. Uh, I would say that uh, to, yeah, to resonate with what Maureen seen, uh, said, sorry, um, I mean, yeah, technology is helping on the, as I said, the, the measurement protocol, which is key on, on, on the model to, to assess and to monitor the, the, the savings that are actually being achieved uh, with, with the solution. And uh, something that was not be, couldn't, be, couldn't be done in a few decades ago. And, and yeah, it's, it's key to show that the model is working. It's key to show that uh, it's actually achieving the results that um, yeah, were yep. expected. All right, I'm going to ask one more since nobody's been brave enough to come up here. Helder, I'm going to give you the last one, which is we've talked so much about all of the pros, I guess, about making the shift about, about how uh, we're able to free up some investment dollars. But maybe you want to talk a little bit about the balance of both the, the pros and the cons of this CapEx to OpEx shift. OK, I believe the pros, they are very clear, right? But there's no that's a perfect solution. So there are some cons. Uh, I did a small list here. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing is the paperwork, the bureaucracy. You have a supplier with this solution. It does not mean just because the supplier says it's a solution, it's a solution. We need to get the, the documentation sent to accounting in Luxembourg, Europe, mm. for them to give the, the approval. It takes time. Okay? They give the thumbs up, comes back. We need to sign an NTA. We need to convince several people inside the plant, the CFO, the COO, the CEO, everybody. And most of them just pretend they understand the business, or the framework. <laughs> and at the end, it takes more time than simply to buy the equipment. OK. Another point after the equipment is there, we need to manage the contract. We need to have someone every month to do the, the balance if how much was saved or not. Okay? You don't, it, just, you don't just trust what Thibaut has to say? Oh, uh, someone <laughs> has to do the, put the initials there. Uh, another point is uh, it's a three, five years, ten years contract. In the meantime, we can have a change in the baseline. I was producing, let's say, 10,000 tons and producing now 12,000 tons a day. So we need to go back to the, to the baseline and review it. OK? And another important point is sometimes you have to put a, a, a variable frequency driver, for example, in a critical fan or pump, if it breaks. Uh, part of the, the point to have a, a, this kind of framework is that our people will not do the maintenance. Okay, so can I wait one day, two days for the provider to come and in the meantime to lose one, two million dollars a day? So we need to do this kind, to have this kind of conversation in the beginning. If, if you, uh, the variable frequency driver will fail, breaks, I need to have the possibility to bypass it, for example. Yeah. So this kind of thing should be fought ahead. Yeah. But at the end, uh, the pros uh, outweigh the cons, and I'm, I'm still a very big fan of this framework. Excellent. Well, I want to take a minute to thank each one of you for providing your perspective. And I hope for you guys in the audience and those watching uh, that this will give you some additional thoughts as you have projects underway, as you're looking to unlock the value of your assets, that it doesn't necessarily need to be an upfront capital investment, that there are lots of other ways to think about how those are funded, and about, again, unlocking the value of those assets. Thank you very, very much. Enjoy the rest of the time.